Was... Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney. I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we're very happy to have all of you here. And I'm here this evening with our guest, Naomi Wolf. Hello, Naomi. Nice to see you. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, where are we finding you this evening? I'm in Salem, Massachusetts. Excellent, excellent. And I understand you spend part of the year there. Yes, we commute back and forth. Um, otherwise, we're in the Hudson River Valley. I have a, a, a wonderful stepson here. So. Great, great. And um, for those of you who have not been to Stonewall, we're located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we have one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the United States. Um, the library itself has um, uh, 28,000 volumes in it, fiction, nonfiction, biography, um, art, poetry, memoir, all organized under the Library of Congress system. You can see our card catalog uh, when you go to our website at stonewall-museum.org. Uh, we've been around for 47 years. Uh, we were actually started uh, by a young gay man here in Florida in um, uh, 1973 who was coming out and wanted to find stuff about himself and his community and started with a small little group of books about this big, about uh, gay, gay books, things like City and the Pillar and, and a few others like that. And it has grown into this huge phenomenal library. They do say it is the largest um, LGBTQ library in the world. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know who keeps track of those things, but uh, I don't I don't know of, of any other book library as big as this. And so if you're here, uh, we're certainly open to the public. Um, and then in addition to that, we have an archive. And the archive again started with just people donating their papers and books and those kind of things. And now the archive is um, 2,700 linear feet, which is how archives are generally cataloged. And if you imagine that, you go up all the way one side of the Empire State Building and all the way down the other side, that's 2,700 square feet. It totals about 6 million pages of LGBTQ history. The majority of it is from uh, 1950 to the present day, although certainly we do have some objects uh, from the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. In addition, we do, um, we do events like this. We've started this virtual series in the beginning of COVID-19. Um, and this is, this is probably show number 37 or 38. We do one every week. They last for an hour. And if you have questions or comments, please pop them into the chat or into the Q&A and we'll get to them in the last uh, 15 minutes of the, the talk. And if you have friends who you'd like to, uh, to tell about this particular uh, talk, uh, they can see it online. Uh, it will be either on our Facebook page. And hello to all of our friends on Facebook out there. Hello, happy to have you all here. And, uh, and also, we archive them all on our website. You can see all the past talks on the website, as well as the upcoming talks. We are booked now through September. Um, and we have a whole list of additional people who would like to be on the series as well, too. So. We, we do one each week for an hour and we continue to bring uh, to, to bring new voices in. And if there's somebody you want us to talk to, please reach out to us and give us the suggestion. We're not shy about asking the people. Almost everybody says yes, which is great. Uh, and so and so that's nice as well as well too. Um, exhibitions, we, we have two up right now. One is called Off Our Backs, which is a look at early lesbian publications from 1950 to uh, 2000. And that was curated by Megan Kent, who is the chief curator at the Hollywood Center for Arts and Culture here in Florida. And um, also we just opened an exhibition called The Saint, which was based upon the legendary disco in New York that was open from 1980 to 1988. And uh, we have a lot of ephemera and original posters, art posters for, from The Saint. Both of those um, exhibitions, we have curator talks for them and they too are available on our website. And finally, you can get, um, you can join up for our newsletter. I promise we won't ask for money too many times. Uh, and uh, again, all of that is stonewall-museum.org. Um, I'd like to say hello to my colleague, Emery Grant, who's uh, back there in the shadows. Emery, say hello, nice to see you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Wolf, for being here. Thank you. Are you ready? And uh, Emery is, is very helpful in trying to make sure that all of these things run smoothly. And so happy to have Emery here as well. 
So Naomi, it's nice to meet you. Um, our, you know, I was in Boston and Provincetown for a long period of time, but our paths had never crossed. And so it's really nice to meet you face to face there. I've certainly been a fan of your work all these years. That's so kind of you. And I was sharing before we went live that this is an incredibly moving and, and, and you know, personally very exciting evening for me because um, I, I admire what you're doing at the Stonewall National Museum and Archives so much. It's so necessary. And also because my hero, John Addington Simmons, as I was saying, longed his whole life to be canonical and to be part of a larger discussion in, in books and, and records about LGBTQ history and literature. So this is a, it feels like a homecoming for my hero and, and also for, I'm just so thrilled to be here. That's great. You know, it is, it's an interesting point that you raise about the idea of somebody like Simmons or somebody from the 19th century, even somebody, A, from the first half of the 20th century, even the first three quarters of the 20th century. The idea of a gay archive was something that they couldn't even imagine. Um, it was really just a strange, a strange experience. Well, so you've spent a fair amount of your adult life. You and I were talking and your first book came out in what, 1991? When I was a baby, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you've been, you have been researching and writing books uh, for, you know, 30 years now. Um, years. Yeah. Tell us, uh, what have you learned as a researcher and writer? Oh, gosh. Um, that is a huge, gigantic question. Uh, I guess... I mean, with every book, I learn something new, right? And, and often you don't know what a book is until it reaches readers and enters that kind of larger public discussion. I guess I, one of the main things I learned is that um, I don't think I write in any kind of controversial way at all, but my books are often described as controversial and that puzzles me, but then reading you know, back, especially in the history of the 19th century, uh, the people that I talk about in Outrages who were the first feminists in the West, I mean, the first organized feminists um, in Britain, certainly, and the first um, not yet organized, but about to be organized advocates for LGBTQ rights, what we would call LGBTQ rights, and, and you know, advocates for, you know, women having the right to sexual autonomy, like Annie Bazant, all of these radicals, um, and, and even poets like Walt Whitman, they they also thought they were just saying things that were very basic, humanistic, commonsensical, and they were greeted with, you know, outrage and horror. So knowing a little bit of history is kind of reassuring because it does seem like, you know, many, many people whose work we now take for granted uh, were initially met with um, great alarm. And so looking back on, for instance, the beauty myth, it was... It, you know, taken as a very controversial work. And now it's like so vanilla, <laughs> you know, it's taught to Girl Scouts. Um, so that's one thing I have learned. And I guess another thing I learned, I learned this really from my dad. I was very lucky to have had a father who was a professional writer, even though not a well-known one. Um, an important thing I kind of took with me into the journey of being a writer is his lesson that the career of the writer really doesn't matter. What matters is the life of the writer. And even if you have one reader um, or no readers in your lifetime, making the most perfect book you can is what counts and everything else is nonsense and noise. And that's been useful because, um, you know, any writer has kind of ups and downs in their career and larger audiences and smaller audiences. and just keeping my eyes on the prize of there's a story here to tell. You and I were talking about stories. Um, I have to tell it as truly as I can uh, has really been a source of strength for me. Yeah, and it's so nice to hear you say that about writers because of course so much of that is true of visual artists and composers and, and poets um, and you know, and really artists across the, the board. And, and somehow uh, we have lost our way with regard to even this term is, is somewhat bad, but with, with regard to artistic pr production, where so much of it is tied to either uh, personal success or financial success, as opposed to an appreciation of the creative pr product or the process. Sometimes it's not even the product, it's about the pr process, which is important. And I think particularly artists like, like yourself who, 
want to put a lot of research in their work and, and want to put inter interpretation, honest inter interpretation in their, their work, it becomes problematic for them to be able to find a spot in order to be able to get this work out. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you speak from deep familiarity with the archival process. I mean, it certainly has been amazing for me in this book. I guess, I guess more than, you know, issues of interpretation and just to kind of, you know, hit it directly out of the ballpark. Many of you may know who are watching that outrages, you know, the initial publication was in the United States was canceled by Houghton Mifflin. And uh, it, in, in the second iteration, um, uh, one of my interpretations was challenged by a critic who was the same critic who challenged my, my actually mistaken interpretations of two cases in 2019. Um, so this book has definitely had a journey uh, mm -hmm. to get to readers. Um, I'm really proud that it's been number one or number two in British history, in European history on barnesandnoble.com since its publication in Britain and has received many, you know, honors in spite of that, you know, uh, a lot of attack, especially in 2019, um, both accurate and inaccurate. And I'm, I'm honored and proud, you know, I won't enumerate them, but the LGBTQ press especially has been incredibly supportive um, of this book. So I just want to say about, you know, that, that um, while I did in 2019 misinterpret two cases, I thought two men had been executed and they hadn't, what was really interesting, and I I immediately, as I always do, you know, 35 years, you know, if I make a mistake ever, I immediately publicly correct it. And, you know, that's one reason I think my readers trust me after 35 years, because um, I'm completely transparent with them. However, what was really interesting to me watching what turned into kind of a global <laughs> assault on this book, especially uh, when it first came out last, you know, in 2019, is that a lot of the attacks were not accurate and they were not accurate in a way that really erased a very important part of LGBTQ history in my view. Um, and so what this book is about is a pioneer of LGBTQ history, in my opinion, John Addington Simmons, who is not well known and should be. And he, I, as I understand it, wrote what is probably the first gay rights manifesto in English. There were others in other European languages at the time he wrote A Problem in Modern Ethics, but you know that was the first in English and it went on to transform our world because it got absorbed after his lifetime into sexual inversion and then that was a huge bestseller. And um, he wrote against the law and judges who had severely criminalized uh, sex between men um, you know, any kind of sexual contact or affection that was physical between men in Britain. So what people don't know, what I didn't know as a student of literature at really good universities, you know, and a student of the 19th century, um, wasn't taught to us that Britain was a context of incredible sadism and danger toward men whom we'd call gay. Um, we were taught that uh, the La Boucher Amendment in 1885, which everyone knows who studies, you know, this period at all, criminalized all sexual contact between men. We were taught that that was the high point and that, you know, then Oscar Wilde's uh, conviction for uh, gross indecency for two years at hard labor was the worst thing that happened in the 19th century to gay men. And I'm just going to use the shorthand gay men because it's anachronistic, but, you know, otherwise be too complicated to say men whom today we would call gay. So when you go back, and as I did in, in Outrages, reading um, the primary work of important queer history scholars and legal history scholars such as uh, Paul Johnson and um, and H.G. Cox and Charles Upchurch, you know, people who did work in this area long before I did and primary source scholars, right? You know, I am shining a light on their work. This was not something that was my interpretation. They, they concluded, especially H.G. Cox, categorically in nameless offenses uh, and Graham Robb also repeated and, and, you know, expanded on his research that 56 men had been executed in Britain for sodomy in the 19th century. Um, not in question. However, the attacks on my book last in 2019 erased that and claimed that that hadn't happened and that it wasn't true. And um, 
And there are other misreadings, you know, even now in the popular press that all serve to basically soft pedal the, you know, atrocities committed against men who had sex with men in, in the 19th century by the British state. And I just think it's so extraordinary. I mean, my mentor, Paul Johnson, who's one of my expert readers, he's at York University and he wrote um, Buggery in Parliament, a fantastic uh, summary of the law against same sex offenses. I'm using the 19th century language now. Um, he just had a bill that is being passed in the House of Lords to posthumously pardon men who were uh, criminalized, sentenced, sentenced to hard labor and executed in the British armed forces in the 19th century, in the Navy, in the army. Um, so belatedly, this history is being dragged into light, but it has been absolutely shocking to me, um, these erasures. And also it Lastly, and I'll stop, but you know, we're talking about archives and you're an archivist. It really raises questions, deep questions about who writes history and, and how. And that's why I'm so worshipful and kind of such a fangirl about your archive, because um, you know, those it's a truism, those who have power write the history, they keep the archives, and everything else is, you know, ephemera or um trash or thrown out uh, and forgotten. Um, but but it is extraordinary to me that um, you, to find out what really happened to gay men in the 19th century, you have to go behind paywalls or spend a lot of money for textbooks to get these men's fantastic scholarship. However, misinformation, whitewashing these crimes against men in the 19th century um, were free in the Huffington Post, in the BBC, in the Guardian, uh, in the New York Times, you know, to this day. So it really raises, uh, it surfaces to me that there's a kind of inequality in who gets access to good information about history, as well as, you know, what we know to be true, which is that um, misogyny and homophobia and racism uh, are constantly erasing history. Amen. <laughs> uh, it's uh, no, it's uh, that was an amazing uh, synopsis of what has gone on vis-a-vis um, -vis the gay community and the entire LGBTQ community. And of course, the trans community is um, a victim of a lot of, of a lot of that today as well, too. But I do want to I do want to just um, touch on two things in what you said. One is the fact that um, having seen the controversy at the time about your book, the outrage about outrage was just um, an enrage as far as I was con concerned. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean by that, but it sounds good. <laughs> uh, it, it, no, seriously. Um, it, you know, and, and, um, uh, and, and listen, I know that these things are painful to go through. But by the same token, obviously, you're centered enough to, to know that, yes, of course, we can all make mistakes. Uh, since the time I got up at six o'clock this morning till right now, I can probably list uh, 50 mistakes that I've made. But like you, I'm willing to admit my mistakes and I'm willing to m move on. And again, so much of, so much is a, is a degree of interpretation as well, too. Um, and so... Uh, that the outrage over outrage just didn't make sense to me. But 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 again, it was obviously a very real experience for you. And 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 so, you know, it was a nice way of sort of hearing about your career as a writer and and how how that stuff has 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 shaped you. But let me sort of move a bit away from the personal part. Of course, we're going to get to the book. And just so everybody knows, of course, we're talking about out, outrageous sense sexorship, uh, sex censorship and the criminalization of love here with Naomi Wolf. Um, but, you know, one question that I've studied a fair amount and, um, I, you know, sure, I have my feeling and, and beliefs about it, but I'm always interested in hearing others, but particularly those who have, have uh, researched this so much is where does that personal outrage come from? is, you know, we, we, we've heard the outrage about religion and we've heard the outrage about procreation and we've heard the outrage about morality. And then we've heard sort of the rumors about, well, it's, um, it's self-loathing and latent homophobia 
Um, uh, we've heard outrage about the ick factor, that people get very literal when they think about men having sex with each other. Uh, and they, 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 they somehow objectify it or, or visualize it in some kind of way. But I've never really felt comfortable that I really understood, and, and not that you necessarily are gonna have to have the answer, but having spent a fair amount of time in looking at this, where does the outrage really come from? I mean, from within, within people, what's the, what, what have you seen as, as being sort of the, the common denominator of, of the outraged? Um, uh, is it about power? Is it about control? Is it about, is it about sexism? Is it about misogyny? I mean, what is it about? Right. Are you asking what I think is the like animus behind homophobia based yeah. on what I've learned in yeah. research. Yes. I, I have some, I, you know, I, I can't pretend to say I know the answer. That would be incredibly arrogant, but I have some thoughts. Yeah, tell me, tell they're, me they're what, you, what, what, what you've gleaned. Well, first, I mean, so I did put together kind of a history of sodomy and the law, you know, or same sex love and sex and the law. Um, and I was glad to do that because it was hard to find. Like there isn't a simple story. And when there isn't a simple story about what is the history of, you know, how sodomy was treated or how same sex love and sex was treated at different times and places, it's very easy for history to be whitewashed. You know, just skipping ahead to the 20th century, I grew up in San Francisco at the ground zero of the LGBTQ rights movement. My parents were Bohemians. I, I was completely immersed in, you know, gay rights activism all around me. Um, and I didn't know till I did the research in this book that uh, the reawakening of LGBTQ rights activism in the 20th century was happening decades and decades before Stonewall, you know, was, had been happening from the very beginning, right through the end of the 20th century. I had no idea. Um, so there's so much erasure. And so uh, going to your question, I found a couple of interesting things. One of them is that abomination, which is the source, I believe in Levit Leviticus, uh, that every fundamentalist cites and saying, you know, men should not lie with men the way they do with a woman. It's an abomination. That is a real mistranslation or bad translation from the Hebrew. And I happen to speak Hebrew. So uh, I'm aware that abomination is like too uh, scary and aversive a word for that category, um, uh, which is really about um, something considered impure or unkosher. So seafood is considered impure and unkosher. And, you know, women having sex, you know, before they're married is considered impure and unkosher. I'm Jewish, I can say this, a million things were considered impure and unkosher in the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the nature of that uh, ancient text. And we do tons of them all the time. Christian fundamentalists do tons of them all the time. They eat shrimp, for instance, or eat pork, or, you know, um, work on Saturday, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the idea, you know, that entered English, that abomination is something that really especially offends God and horrifies God is just literally a mistranslation um, and a decontextualization of what that category of the impure uh, meant um, then and what other, you know, things are in it, which is a ton of stuff. Um, so moving ahead to the 19th century, which is where things really get um, interesting, like I can't speak to the Catholic Church, right? I don't get it, but the Catholic Church secured its power, no disrespect to Catholics or to the church by condemning a lot of things and, you know, saying that women who were property owners were witches and, you know, so on and so on. So that I would say is a politics, um, but you didn't even see a lot of systematic persecution. I mean, scholars differ on this. John Boswell thinks there was a lot of tolerance in the Middle Ages of same-sex love between men. Um, you know, others don't, but you don't see the systematic persecution, uh, certainly by the secular state. There wasn't a secular state. However, secular state was invented in the 19th century, the modern state, um, and a civil legal system was invented. At that time, I mean, basically the argument of outrages really does answer the question, where does modern homophobia in a systematic way come from? And the answer is, it was a tactic 
a political tactic to oppress the whole population using gay people as um, kind of exemplars of what the state could do to bodies and humans and love and privacy. And so basically in a total nutshell, the argument of outrages is a lot like the argument of the beauty myth, you know, that said that this kind of mythology arose right when women were becoming more powerful. So it was a backlash. So by the same token, in the early 19th century, you know, Britain was faced with a lot of pressure for a more egalitarian world and sharing power from, you know, the Chartist movement, you know, there had been a revolution in France, um, there was pressure for women to own property, there was pressure for universal suffrage, and uh, the elites needed a way to control populations. So then in the middle of the century, you get a lot of, you know, very atypical legislation that the to suppress people in a way the church no longer could, because it was now a secular democracy or, you know, Dem democratic monarchy. And so you get like the Obscene Publications Act in 1857, which takes this whole tradition of free speech in Britain and says, you know, now the state can decide what you read, what you publish, you know, what, what you can write. And that chilled, you know, writers for the rest of that century. I mean, up until the great trials of the 20th century to, to free writers from that bad law. But you also see a proliferation of legislation hystericizing same-sex uh, sexual contact. And you see that happening right at the time, and this is, I will promise I will stop, but this is the core thesis. You see it, you see the demonization of um, gay sex, especially sodomy, in hysterical language, what Scott Long calls a moral panic, in a new way, right at the moment that feminists start to point a finger at heterosexual men's really abusive sexual practices, and they start to be successful at it. So they start to say in the middle of the 19th century, you guys are trafficking 10 year olds, girls and 12 year olds to have sex with them. You guys are, you know, consuming women as sex workers and discarding them. You guys are stealing women's property. You know, you're stealing women's children and, they're, and you're beating women. And this is all, you know, you are perverts basically and you're abusive, sadistic perverts. Right at the moment in specifically with the uh, divorce bill in 1857, that feminists were really, you know, shining a light on bad things straight men did with their sexuality, real amoral behavior. That's when the phrase rape, sodomy, buggery, uh, I'm sorry, rape, sodomy, bestiality entered the law in the divorce bill. And right around then you get this kind of increasing, increasing um, aversive language that we think of as just part of homophobia, uh, kind of getting minted. And, and so the whole culture of straight men said, look over there, those are the perverts. You know, those are the people threatening the nuclear family. Uh, you know, not me with my 12 year old prostitute. You know, those are, those are the people whose sexual behavior you really need to worry about. And so I think it was a, a deflection and a redirection. And it was also a way for the state to flex its power and intrude on privacy, control bodies. I mean, gay men were subject in the 1870s to venereal exams, you know, anal exams by venereologists. Um, it, just the way women had been in the 1860s if they were thought of as being prostitutes. So this is the state saying, I can control and invade your body. And that is a message to everyone who was mobilizing and organizing and protesting that the state has this terrifying power. So I really think, you know, from then on, it worked really, really well. Straight people, especially straight men, began to say, oh my God, I don't want that to happen to me. And so things that used to be thought, you know, kind of smiled at, like men in dresses, you know, in the Fanny and Stella uh, trial, Initially, the press was quite amused. You see the same thing in New Orleans in the 1840s, um, cross-dressing men, you know, people we call trans, trans people, I guess, or couples living together of the same sex were, were spoken of with kind of amused acceptance, like this is a human nature, it's a foible. Uh, but after the 1870s, understandably, you know, as these venereal exams began to be like reported in the press, straight men's fashion changed and became super boring in uniform. And a lot of things men just used to do as part of being human became kind of taboo and self-censored. You know, anything having to do with sentiment, anything having to do with the arts or, you know, fashion or, you know, culinary interest or 
uh, you know, expressions of, of love, which men used to pour out, you know, to each other, straight, gay, didn't matter, those labels didn't exist. That was all um, restricted. And, and straightness became a thing that we now inherit that I think cripples straight men and gay men became kind of that which the state can stigmatize and invade and prosecute and punish and silence and brutalize. And so that is my answer. Yeah, and wow, an amazing answer. <laughs> There's there is certainly so much there, and of course, you know, just to finish up on on that last point, and of course, that was all uh, exacerbated by what happened in the United States and in, in Western Europe in the 20th century, and the response and, and the response to uh, to uh, even a, a, a greater uh, hypersensitivity to ma maleness. But what's what's interesting is how, how you speak about that in the beginning is the idea. Um, there are two things that, that jump out at me, and then we're going to get to the book and some readings from the book here, but this conversation is just so fascinating. It's the first idea that, that you're putting out there, the fact that individuals may have had sex with, with members of the same sex was really no different than anything else than if they might have been pet owners, or they might have just, it was just, it was just something that they did. And it was just it, it, and but that it was used against them for power and for c control and, and that particular way. And then the other thing I want to say that it sort of re resonated with me in what you said is the fact to defend oneself. And now you're talking about a lot of the men in power that um, from the accusations that were coming against them, it's very reminiscent of the administration that we've seen for the last four years, where the idea of somebody telling a lie all the time is just calling those, calling them out on the lie, liars. The fact that they were called, that the, the media is, is being called fake news. It's only just using the truth as a weapon or what they're guilty of as a we right. weapon of being able to get to those to those other individuals. And it's, it's so insidious. It's really just about power as opposed to any other moral standing that people are going after here. Well, I think you're right. I mean, can I jump in on the first yeah. one and then speak yeah. to the second one? I think this is such an important conversation to have because you and I were talking before we went live about how, you know, boys and girls internalize, you know, people of all genders internalize this, what I now have come to see as, at least in the modern period, largely manufactured um, sense of disgust, aversion, and, and, and subsequently shame for the person you know, that that disgust and aversion is directed at. So um, it's very cynical and, uh, and yet it has such deep harms to our kids and to ourselves, you know, growing up uh, receiving a, a narrative about disgust and aversion. So let me slightly um, kind of uh, push back a bit at the, the way you phrased, understandably, your first question. It's not, it wasn't exactly that <clears throat> the first half of the 19th century um, sleeping with another man was like being a pet owner, but it, in, in some ways it was very different from what happened later. So all sexual contact between men was illegal since 1740 in Britain. However, what these scholars of the LGBTQ legal history uh, record show is that even so, men found many, many ways to be together and women found many, many ways to be together. There was space, you know, even under this shadow. Uh, Graham Robb said that until 1861, uh, gay people in Britain lived, un or gay men lived under the shadow of the gallows. And that's true, but um, nonetheless, you see so many, and it's so beautiful, I'm so drawn to it, so many, you know, letters and novels and, um, you know, photographs when photography became a technology that show deep, passionate love between men. I mean, I'm interested that my book was canceled in its first iteration. It's now out by Chelsea Green. But uh, one of the things my book shows is that Abraham Lincoln, as many scholars have proven, but it's not widely known, you know, slept with a man who was, the, you know, his love, basically, everyone spoke of his intimate friend that way um, for, for years. And that these relationships were not unusual. It was common um, to have 
this kind of intimacy. I mean, there are photographs of men sitting on the laps of other men and embracing each other. Uh, so many. What we didn't have then, though, what the society didn't have was the language that came later with sexology of homosexual, heterosexual. Um, there were other terms, but mostly there was what allures me about that time was that there was space for love if you just didn't get caught. And of course, class was a big factor there because poor people lacked privacy. So a lot of people who did get caught and sentenced were, were lower income. Um, but having said that, what's really interesting too is that in some ways, you know, that aversion didn't exist. What I mean is you, you, sodomy was seen as something any man could do under certain circumstances or would want to do. So it wasn't un understood or thought of that a certain group of men are, have a sexual identity or orientation. That was a concept that didn't exist at that time. But it was understood that in the Navy or in prison or in you know very all male environments, men would want to have sodomy with each other. Um, anyone could. So it was the act, you know, and there's this like legal category before 1857, even though it was quite illegal, it was categorized along with sheep stealing and coin clipping, right? Not murder and arson, which is how it was recategorized later. So it was like, you know what, don't do it. But any, you know, anyone can understand why you'd want to do it, right? Like you shouldn't, you know, clip those coins, meaning get a little extra gold out of them. You shouldn't take your neighbor's property, but eh, it's, you know, it's tempting, whatever. These were seen as human uh, temptations, even though they had serious uh, penalties. Um, so that's what H.G. Cox and I really agree on reading, you know, how discourse in newspapers and in parliamentary debates changed over the course of the 19th century. It went from, eh, don't do it, don't get caught, you know, even though it was a very serious crime, if you did get caught to, um, huh, you know, all of that kind of the yuck factors, you said that really wasn't part of what, what surrounded the act of sodomy in the first um, half of the 19th century. It, it definitely came later. And, and I, I do think it was hystericized. I mean, I think it was, it was a, a moral panic that was drummed up um, out of whole cloth and, and proved to be really useful. And and I and I agree with you one hundred percent. In my in my comment or, or distinction about whether you were a pet owner, it just I'm just talking about a particular characteristic or attribute to right. one particular person that could be as innocuous as something else, but yet because of all the hysteria that you're talking about, it was used to weaponize. Uh, behavior against a certain group of people. And so, and that's the, that's sort of the false morality, which has been placed on top of this uh, in order to be able to advance somebody else or secure somebody else. It's, it's just that somebody might like chocolate, you know, imagine, Im imagine if, if they went, you know, gung ho and, you know, anybody who'd like chocolate was equal to what they did to anybody who liked having sex with a member of their same of their same gender. It's just a matter of, of proclivity of taste of, of who they are, and it just it just and it was so convenient for, for them. You know, I mean, convenient. And and just to jump in, a great example of how right you are is the fact that the law didn't even notice what we would call lesbianism for the entirety correct. of the nineteenth century. There was no law against it because, as I like to say, if a penis isn't involved, you know, it doesn't matter. It matters. <laughs> exactly. And so it wasn't criminalized. And so there were many, many what Henry James called Boston marriages. Sure. You know, Emily Dickinson was writing passionate love letters to her sister in law. Women were, you know, sleeping together as men were in the same bed and kissing and hugging and saying, Darling, I miss you so much. And, and there wasn't a language of, oh, those those dykes, you know, or, right. it, and just to, again, slightly tweak, you know, the, the people who like chocolate thing, I would go further in the first half of the 19th century, even though it was severely criminalized, it's not that sodomy was seen as something that some people liked. Mm -hmm. It's that it was assumed that anyone could, any man could like sodomy under certain circumstances. So, okay. and, and, and so, again, they assumed that they were, if they were assuming any man could like it, they were assuming they could like it. 
Well, now you really <laughs> get to the heart of the matter, which is once you have a behavior so prescribed, which is such a human desire, it's just part of our you know, human, I mean, which is why I love Whitman. This is why Simmons loved Whitman, because Whitman was like, I love everything. I love anything's possible. I'll, I want to touch every, you know, it's like, you know, he, he, he transcended every kind of boundary. You know, we start out as babies loving everything and wanting to touch everything. I'm not saying sexual orientation is not innate for many, many people. Um, but the, the, for many people who later have to say, okay, I'm straight, you know, that involves a tremendous repression of organic attraction and desire and desire for contact and falling in love with people who are the wrong, wrong gender. So uh, I, I do think that the 19th century taught kind of everyone who wasn't identified as part of that, you know, quite criminalized and toward the end of the middle of the 19th century sort of hated and reviled group of gay men, you know, everyone else had to kind of suppress a core aspect of themselves and what made them human. And by the way, this is one reason I really love Simmons and this period and Whitman is that sexology is fabulous in that it gave, you know, our modern or 20th century concept of there's a range of human sexual uh, attraction and expression, you know, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, etc. Uh, and they're all on a natural spectrum, right? That's useful con compared to this is a vice and this is a moral failing, you know, that was before it. However, it's also quite limiting, you know, a lot of people find. And I, I did my whole life. Like I didn't identify with any of those categories it, it, specifically. They're, they were all kind of not quite right for how I felt about myself. So then when a new generation says fluid is an option, you know, that Whitman-esque kind of, you don't have to choose, you know, um, or it can be about the person, you know, that may not be true for a lot of people, but I think it is true for a lot of people. And, and so that's- um, certainly, certainly the generation of our children's generation certainly have found, at, at least have begun to open that door compared to our generation. And, and it's been really nice to be able to see it. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, but I want to get to the book because we yes. are. <laughs> and so uh, this has just been, so um, help our audience understand a, a little bit about Simmons and sort of set it up. I know you have something from the introduction there. Sure so. thing. So this book is based on a doctoral thesis I wrote um, and my advisor, a uh, great scholar of LGBTQ history, uh, Dr. Stefano Maria Evangelista, gave me Simmons letters. So one day in the comfortable top floor study at Trinity College, where we met weekly so he could review my work, uh, Dr. Evangelista handed me two immense volumes bound in a deep olive green fabric. There was a third volume waiting on the bookshelf to be taken up when I was finished with the first two. The books contain the letters of someone of whom I had never heard, John Addington Simmons. You should read these, my professor had said. This began a journey of five years of study, during which I grew increasingly fascinated with this elusive, tormented, world-changing character. The more I got to know John Addington Simmons through his letters, um, I may have to walk to another room, let my, my dog be fed by my partner, but so we won't have the... We won't have the barking. Uh, uh, nope, uh, the more I got to know John Addington Simmons through his letters, and the more I read about the men and women around him, the more present he seemed. In spite of the lapse of time between our lives, in Oxford especially, he often seemed to be just down the street. At times when I was reading his letters in the Bodleian uh, at New College or in the New College Library, his prescient voice seemed just a carol away. Every day as I walked over the cobblestones leading out of New College, passed under the arched Bridge of Sighs and went out along Broad Street, I saw Balliol's neo-Gothic doorway on my right, and that was his college. I would glance in at the smooth lawns of the courtyard and at the gabled rooms where this love affair between lovers who were just grown out of boyhood had been carried out, and then it seemed had been painfully cut short. In life, Simmons composed volumes and volumes, biographies, travel essays, books of verse, art criticism, translations, and textbooks. His letters alone, as I mentioned, constituted three massive tomes. He was, if anything, persistent in expressing himself. Nonetheless, he also insisted on silences. 
Simmons became the centerpiece of my doctoral thesis, but even after that was completed and handed in, I kept learning more about him from the astonishing clues that he had left behind for archivists and scholars. These discoveries led me to write this book. Though little known today outside the academic disciplines of Victorian studies and queer studies, Simmons should have a much more prominent place in history. He can truly be identified as one of the fathers of the modern gay rights movement. He can even be called an originator of what we now understand as the modern identity of male homosexuality in the West. His insistence regarding how to think about love and his demand that male-male love and attraction be recognized as innate, natural, and healthy, rather than as acquired, quote, neuroses, degeneracies, or diseases, help to craft our modern understanding of what it means to be a man who loves and desires other men. Simmons would, until the very end of his life, use code to express his messages about love between men. He employed metaphors, misdirections, visual emblems, embargoed manuscripts, and lockboxes, both rhetorical and real. He would spend his life creating and then hiding his true meanings, leaving signals for us, the men and women of the future, to decipher. He tried to address the issue of men loving men in a wide range of genres, translating biographies and sonnets of homosexual artists, such as Michelangelo Buonarroti and Benvenuto Cellini, composing a textbook of the lives of classical Greek poets, offering thinly veiled satire to a college journal, producing unpublished manifestos that scarcely saw the light of day, and producing collections of love poems using feminine pronouns to mask the true gender of the beloved. He tried to address the central issue of his life and work by publicly collecting art by a disgraced artist and by publishing reviews to defend homosexual writers who were under attack. He died relatively young, but by working assiduously for slightly more than three decades, he scattered deliberately into the future a set of seeds for a more progressive world than the one in which he lived, seeds of the world we now see around us if we live in the West. Simmons tried to express his belief that sexual love between men was innate and natural before there were concepts, let alone language, to support this idea. He was one of the people who invented the language. He spoke in every way he could as doing so became more and more illegal. This book will follow John Addington Simmons' life as an essayist, poet, advocate, husband, father, and lover. Simmons' personal story offers a lens through which we may see a greater cultural and political struggle. But the personal biography is also a story of state intervention in our personal lives and in our words, and a cautionary tale about what happens to us when that is permitted to be. Mm. Just so beautifully written in such a wonderful way. Oh, thank, it's just so, so great. And, and being able to being able to hear um, you know, his his accomplishments in this way is really just so nice. And of course, the book, of course, goes through them all. Just to give the audience a little bit of of, of context factually. So what year was he born and what year did he die? 1840 he was born and 1893 he died. And he spent most of his time where? Well, that's a good question because he wanted to be a great man of letters in Britain, but by the time he was in his mid twenties, he realized after having been railroaded, uh, you know, watching his father blackmail his headmaster at boarding school because his headmaster was gay, um, and then going to Oxford, falling in love with it young man, as I mentioned, and then realizing there was no future for them. And then as a, a fellow of modeling college being blackmailed again because of homoerotic content in his letters. And then finally having his, his desire to be professor of poetry, a, a very um, laudable role in, in Oxford when he was in his mid twenties derailed because of his Greek proclivities, right? He realized that there was no future for him in England. Uh, the continent had decriminalized sex between men with the Napoleonic Code. Um, so he went to, he married, he had four children, gay men at that time overwhelmingly did marry and have children, which is, you know, really weird and notable 
to, to think about and read about, um, some of the most moving parts of his memoir are described how lonely it is to be on your honeymoon night, you know, with a woman that he, you know, respects and, and cares about, but has no sexual desire for at all. Um, and so he went to, uh, to Switzerland, uh, he was tubercular. And so the air was better for him in Davos. But then by the time he had four children and realized what he called the wolf, which was his desire for men, which was unceasing, nothing he did as a Victorian Potter familius would, you know, squelch it. And then he came to realize after reading Leaves of Grass and finding Whitman that there was nothing wrong with that, right? Um, he it lived a double life going back and forth to Venice where there was a younger group of what we would call gay men, um, younger men who were less uh, inhibited about their desires. And finally, just to fast forward so no one's sad or worried in the audience, um, he was a great, great romantic. As I mentioned, he foresaw and wrote poetry about gay marriage long, you know, long before anyone ever thought that would ever be possible. And by the end of his life, toward the end of his life, he found the love of his life, a super handsome gondolier named Angelo Fusato, whom he fell in love with at first sight. So uh, he, he found true love. I mean, he, he still had to leave, lead a double life. Fusato traveled with him as his manservant, um, but his family seems to have accepted that that was his nature. And I'm sure it wasn't Mrs. Simmons' first choice, but his four daughters adored him. You know, he, he was a great dad. Um, he, I think he was very honest with his wife. And I, again, I don't think that was that unusual a situation at that time. And he did, find true love and he embedded, I'll just give away a little bit of the amazing ending of this book. He embedded in his secret memoir that he wrote for us, you know, for the future, uh, a time when there would be a Stonewall National Museum and archive and readers like us. Um, he embedded secret codes that when you unlock them and fit them together, tell the story of his great love affair with Angelo Fusato. Yeah, it's such a, that's such a wonderful story of being able to hear his life in that particular way. And also the idea in where you bring him to the 21st century here of trying to imagine how he would have responded to where we are today. If you think about him in his thirties um, and the idea that we now live in a country in which, you know, it's not certainly not um, at everybody's front door, but at least we have the Supreme Court of the United States recognizing legal same-sex marriage in this country. That would have been something that we can only imagine that he would have just been so overjoyed with. So um, overjoyed. Yeah, Absolutely. because of course, because of course, the way that you describe him is the way that that I have known it, which or known him is the fact that there was this romantic element to him. It was just about love and, and, and the love was around somebody who just happened to be of the same gender as he was, but there was no ick, there was no badness. There was, even though he lived within a world with all that stuff, but for him personally, it was not there. Well, he had to fight through a lot of internal, internalization of self-hatred and self-disgust. And again, Whitman was such a liberating force for him. Um, he read, he read the poem Calamus um, in his late twenties and Calamus, most of us have not read, again, talking to an archivist, most of us have not been exposed to the uncensored 1855 or 1860 editions of Leaves of Grass. They are much steamier and much more homoerotic than what you get in your college class or what I got in my college class from the Penguin edition. And Calamus is about a phallic water plant. I mean, that's the central metaphor and it's just, it's got scenes of men, you know, in a, you know, after fellatio, uh, you know, men embracing in a kind of post erotic context. And it's very explicit about sex between men. Um, and so with Whitman kind of as his interlocutor, he fought through that self-hatred and self-disgust and finally, you know, kind of lifted out of himself his true message, which was, this is noble and yes, uh, he was a great romantic, but there's something else really interesting about going back in LGBTQ history to this time. We tend to, or I grew up, you know, my mom, as I mentioned, wrote the lesbian community when I was a teenager, and she was always, you know, out in the lesbian community in San Francisco, you know, being part of that, um, 
that world and writing about it and advocating for lesbian moms uh, in terms of their custody, which was a big deal at that time and still is sometimes. But we, I grew up in, in San Francisco the way most of us grew up, you know, same sex or any sexuality was narrated in sexological terms. It, it's about the right to have sex with whoever you want. And so it, the discourse was around, you know, sex acts. What's right. so interesting to go back to men desiring men or women desiring women before sexology is how much of the discourse was about love and relationships, right. which is not to say he was a prude. I mean, his Eudiades Acrete not Idol is a poem about sodomy and it culminates, you know, wedding night, an act of sodomy, but it is so romantically narrated <laughs> and, or I should say, and it's so romantically narrated because there's no reason it shouldn't be, right? Any more than heterosexual intercourse as the consummation of two people's great love, you know, Romeo and Juliet, whatever, you know, all the great love stories have an act of consummation that's physical. So sodomy was that for him, but it's just so interesting I'm not trying to make a moral judgment, but it's so interesting to look at discourses of same sex sexuality before sexology because love and relationships, it, you know, encloaked them. They weren't separated. Yeah, and I and I totally agree with you in, in, in the sense, of course, that's what when I speak about the romantic side of it, of that, it is absolutely right. And it does raise the question, which we won't be able to answer, but raises the question as to whether or not from the, you know, from the 19th century uh, version um, with, uh, of the discovery of homosexuals and the creation of those labels and things that, that have happened, whether or not that has hurt the cause more than helped the cause, because in, in a way it's, you know, it put a lot of language around thing where it really is just about the romantic side. We have time for one more reading. And so I think you have another section picked up here. And uh, let's get to that. Super fast. Um, so Simmons, you know, <laughs> so exciting. Simmons was embedding messages in his work, as, as I mentioned. And so in 1876, he wrote uh, these really boring textbooks um, about the lives of the Greek poets, but they were very popular. And I love this uh, moment because uh, Oscar Wilde, of the next generation is reading one of these textbooks. And, and to me, it's the first time I've seen a transmission of um, LGBTQ kind of knowledge and, and empowerment between generations pedagogically. So in January, 1876, Simmons started a seductive epistolary friendship with a new acquaintance, uh, the wealthy poet, memoirist and critic Edmund Goss. Um, he had to approach this new friend gingerly and he used Whitman to help him do so. Uh, he wrote that he saw himself and Goss as both, quote, having the root of calamus within our souls. So just to editorialize, this is an example of how Victorian men who were gay would have to use code like the root of calamus because actually writing anything homoerotic was illegal at this point after 1857. Um, quote, if the letter falls into the hands of the average magistrate, this sentence was unlikely to provoke suspicion. Uh, Goss understood and responded warmly. Um, back in Oxford, meanwhile, Whitman was also on the mind of the student Wilde. He daringly discussed the poet with his Oxford supervisor. And again, Whitman began to be used as code as well. Um, as Wilde wrote to his friend, Willie Morden, he had, quote, nipped up to his viva, his mean oral exam, where, quote, in Aeschylus, meaning in relation to Aeschylus, we talked of Shakespeare, Walt Whitman, and the poetics. Whitman, like, quote, Greek love, like, quote, Phaedrus, was now among the coded sig signals used at Oxford as elsewhere between men who loved men. Was Wilde mentioning Whitman to signal his own orientation to his examiner? Was he perhaps mentioning Whitman to flirt with William Warden? Wilde's generation was chafing outright at the constraints that Simmons' own generation could themselves scarcely bear. In the Morgan Library, if you turn to the second of Wilde's two volumes of Simmons' Studies of the Greek Poets, you'll see that the last essay is a defense of the Greek's homosexuality. Simmons used language directly echoing the wording of the 1873 Indian Penal Code and its judgment on sex acts between men as being, quote, against the order of nature, end quote. Simmons stated clearly, using the Greeks as pretext, that the practice of sexual love between men was not, quote, unnatural, end quote. He defended this love on the basis of what he called its, quote, organicity, 
end quote. The second volume of the series came out two years after the first. Wilde had had time to mature and to consider the legacy of writers such as Whitman and Simmons. This time around, meaning with the second volume when he was two years older, Wilde added his name on the title page of the second volume in even more baroquely confident loops of script. Oscar F.O. F.W. Wilde, Oxford, May 76. Across two open pages in this book, you will see an arc of dark drops. They are still a deep purple in color. Wilde was already known at college as a legendary conversationalist who gestured with his hands as he spoke. Are these purple spots faded wine stains flung from the hand of a young Oscar Wilde? Could Wilde have splashed wine as he read, perhaps aloud, to friends Simmons' words from an assigned textbook one that quietly slipped the information to students that in classical antiquity, it was perfectly natural and even warmly admired for men to love other men. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Naomi, this time has gone by so fast. It's just been so great chatting with you. And the book is really wonderful. For those of you who don't have a copy of it, please pick it up. Um, it's You should be able to get it at your local bookseller. I know Barnes and Noble certainly has it as well too. Um, Naomi, thank you so much for being here. It really has been a pleasure chatting with you and having you share your book and also your thoughts about this. And also I wanna thank you for your passion about this topic. Um, and it's really, it's very, it's so heartfelt and, and, um, and you've added a lot to the conversation about this topic and, and both, both your analytical skills and your writing skills and your research have actually created an opportunity for all of us to understand this a little bit better. So thank you. It's really very, it's very much appreciated. Your, your words are, are so warmly uh, welcome to me and I'm so happy and honored uh, to have had this time with you and so happy to bring Simmons to 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 you in your archives. Thank you so, so much for this. And if you ever here in South Florida, please come visit us. We would love to have you walk through the archives because you would certainly enjoy seeing that. Let's say good night to my colleague, Emery Grant. He's back there. Emery, thank, thank you for all your help. Thank uh, you. Hope you enjoyed tonight's talk and um, uh, we will see you all. So come back ne next week, folks. We will have another talk. And if you are not on our mailing list, go to stonewall-museum.org. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Thank you.